hello, my name is Cheryl. I was still in diapers and I was spent the night in jail. <laughs> so <laughs> that's one of my crazy stories. I'm writing a book and I've been forming it for a long time and it's called On My Way Home. And a lot of my stories seem like it's not truth because it's so unbelievably crazy how my parents would be religious but not converted. They didn't have a heart conversion. And I want to tell my story to give others encouragement that people, loved ones will fail you, but God is always there. And I have proof of this. I have abs irrefutable proof of how God has protected me on my way home to heaven. No matter how much we sin or how mad we get at God, he still cares about us and he shows us he's shown me over and over and over again that he loves me i want to tell you what jesus has done for me and not what satan has done to me over the years i i have hummingbirds that winter over and i have to make sure that they have their their feed always have their feed ready uh, i'll just let him eat out of this and uh, we're in Eagle Creek, Oregon, but we're 150 feet over the edges of Boring, Oregon. <laughs> we, we started going to the Boring Church <laughs> in Boring. We had a Boring pastor. They had a pastor dull long time ago, about 30 years ago, 40 years ago when they built this church. But I, I like to feed the hummingbirds. I have two hummingbirds that are wintering over. We've lived here for, on this street for 35 years. We lived at the first driveway in that beautiful home up on the knoll. It was tri-level and then my arthritis became too bad. So we needed this one level, but the price was close to a million dollars. But I've always wanted to live in this house here. This was my dream house, but I have Eller Danlos and mast cell disease that is causing my body a lot of pain. I can't climb the stairs. This was my dream house and there's no way we could have afforded it, this one, and retire. We kept telling them this has been my dream home for, for years because of the pond and then the house, the view, wait till you see the view. They bought it for 750000 so there's no way they would sell us to us for five fifty. They got mad at first and then they we kept telling them this has been my dream home for, for years. And the people that lived here, they liked us. The Lord worked it out where the people moved their hearts to sell this house to us. We told them we can't do more than 550. They had a lot of money and they said, we have our dream home. We want you guys to have it. So they sold it to us for 550. I'm not saying this house is a mansion. To me, it's a mansion. It's a 40 year old house. <laughs> that needs some upkeeping, but it's where I've wanted to live. The Lord knew what was ahead for me with my pain. I've gotten a lot worse. My health has really gone downhill. I just had spinal fusion surgery and that went sideways. And my pain is just incredible. So I know the Lord gave me this house. Move those people's heart to sell us this house at the price. It's, it's unheard of. And the realtor told us we can get over a million and something. And we'd, we don't want to move. We're too old it, we're too, and it doesn't, the money doesn't mean anything except for doing the Lord's work and that's what we want to do. I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist. My mom and dad met at La Sierra College and uh, my mom is Mexican. And she was Ruth Hernandez. Her parents were very wealthy dairymen in Artesia. And my dad was from a large family, not Christian, uh, very bad people. <laughs> I don't know how to put it. Um, but his heart wasn't with the Lord and he saw my mom as a meal ticket. And then when she got pregnant with me, when she was three months pregnant, he said, I'm out of here. I, I'm sharing my story. It's very negative, very sad and heartbreaking. My dad, Bob, left my mom and he hitchhiked 
to Florida to be with his family. And she had me alone when she was in California, Los Angeles area. And he had girlfriends then, and so my mom was heartbroken. I'm not telling my story to shock or to make you feel bad or feel sorry for me. That's not what I, the intention of my book on my way home that will be out pretty soon. I was just a couple of months old and my mom took the train to Florida and when she got there, Bob says, uh-uh, no kids. I think Bob's family, there was 12 brothers and sisters. There, actually, there were 17 and five were adopted out. They said, you gotta take Cheryl back to California. My mom was just absolutely in love with him and she didn't care what what wrongs he did. He was thieving and card playing and, and with his brothers and drinking and stuff like that. So they didn't have any money for train tickets and they thought they could work their way back uh, begging. And they got, I don't know, a day's drive and they ran out of money and my mom didn't have any formula for me or diapers so they stopped at the police department she got a hold of her parents and said, I need some money, I'm bringing Cheryl back. And so we spent, <laughs> I spent three nights in jail waiting for my grandparents to send the check. So I was still in diapers and I was spent the night in jail. <laughs> so <laughs> that's one of my crazy stories. So uh, they took me back to California and my mom left me with my grandmother and my grandmother raised me for three years. My grandpa was Mexican. He could hardly speak English. He would grab me and he'd go, Cherry. <laughs> he couldn't say Cheryl. He called me Ch Cherry, Chetty. <laughs> and my grandma and grandpa were very, very loving, very loving. And um, I was confused because I didn't have a mom and dad. My grandpa worked all the time, the dairy. You know, you don't get any time off. You just milk the cows and then go eat and change your clothes and go back and milk, I forget how many cows. My mom wanted Bob to be a family man, to go to church and be, uh, be, a hus be her husband. And so she went and got me. And my grandmother was just beyond heartbroken. And she said, please let me adopt Cheryl. And my mom wouldn't. I don't know why she didn't leave me with my grandparents because Bob didn't love me. He, uh, he abused me the minute he saw me. And so I was four years old when I started being physically abused and verbally abused. And uh, my grandmother was just absolutely brokenhearted. And she, uh, my mom says, well, why don't you have a baby of your own? So she did, I have Aunt Denise. <laughs> She's uh, two years younger than me. My mom would work nights and she'd sleep during the day. And uh, I got crea creative, I always liked to craft. So I cut her nylons off, I cut her hair, I turned the gas stove on, <laughs> almost blew it up because we lived in this little tiny trailer. And then uh, I got my bird <laughs> and I squeezed it too hard and I buried it. And I've always wanted to play the piano. When I was little, uh, I found a piano and I started playing, I think it was almost five, and everybody says, your daughter needs lessons. And I begged my parents for piano lessons and a piano, but that never happened. And uh, then when my dear friend Lolita died, Larry, got me a piano. He got me a six foot Boston Steinway grand piano. And I found a teacher and I learned how to play. And I have an incredible pump organ. You're gonna love it. I paid $195 for it on Craigslist and it's in mint condition. I 
get a little shy when I play in front of people. So, but anyway, this has brought me a lot of comfort as my health began sinking and I grappled with God. You know, why are you allowing me to suffer like this? I've not done anything wrong. I was sexually abused at five and six. I had been wetting the bed every night and my mom and my grandmother were shaming me because I wet the bed. And I was scared to go into the bathroom where I had been abused several times. Why my mom would allow a 22-year-old man give her daughter a bath is beyond crazy. And I was blamed for being too sexy. My mom said I was too sexy. I didn't know what sexy meant. And we lived on the property where it's called the Winesville Horrors, where <laughs> they made a movie out of it, The Changeling. And so I don't know what evil was tied to that property. But anyway, I ran outside sobbing when my mom told me she was going to lose her pregnancy. She was almost nine months uh, pregnant and with my sister, Bobby. And I buried my face in my lap and I started sobbing. I said, please, dear God, I don't want my baby sister to die. I want my mom to have the baby. And I'm sorry that I told my mom. I really am sorry that I, that I was being too sexy. Here I am, six years old. And she told me I deserved it because I was being too sexy. And my mom said that God was angry with me. And that's a theme that through my whole life. And then things got worse. And I remember putting my face in my lap and my knees bunched up and just praying and praying and begging God that my mom wouldn't lose the baby. And that's when I told my mom that I was being sexually abused and she told me I deserved it. And to blame a child for being too sexy is absolutely crazy. But my mom would go to church, but then she would pray and then get mad. And that's the way I grew up. In Every year I went to a new school, we moved uh, every couple of months because the landlords uh, wanted their money. My mom was working nights and Bob was out gambling all the time. And so I raised my sisters because my mom was always busy and she was always upset, always crying about Bob not being home or he'd be gone for days at a time and then when he came around he would come on the first or the 15th which is payday and I would tell my mom Bob only comes around on payday and then you give him your paycheck and there's no money for food and rent so I went to uh, Trout Street School then Liberty Bell then La Sierra Demonstration School, Northridge Academy, and then a public school in Corona. Then we moved to Northridge Adventist School. And I never had friends I, because I was always moving and we, I wasn't ever allowed to say that we were moving because we were running from creditors and and then my dad got into some serious trouble where his partner, Fred Smith, went to prison for 10 years. They were selling phony land deals. I stayed with other families. I don't know why. I lived with a family in La Sierra. Their daughter was about my age and she had a, an organ and she played glow worm. And I was, I was just enthralled that she could play glow worm. <laughs> I think I was in the third grade. I always wanted to play, but my mom told me I was too uh, stupid. I lost, I, I failed every grade, but because I was busy with my sisters, I had nobody to help me with homework. And I was mom to Shelby and Bobby, who were seven and nine years younger than me. I was always living with other people, so that was kind of strange because my parents were always going to divorce, always. There was always some kind of upset. We went to Arlington Church, Adventist Church, and we had a Bible worker, Mrs. Ortner. She was so kind and she had a way with, 
with teaching the Bible and scripture and making God seem like a loving character. And it was totally different than what my mom. So my mom would tell me one thing and then the Bible worker would tell me another, would say, you know, with God is love. But then just moving and moving and moving. And then we finally moved up to Grass Valley, California. It was the year that, about the time that Kennedy was shot. I was left alone for weeks and weeks and weeks. Bob would be gone. Bob kept calling my mom a stupid Mexican when I was in the sixth grade. And my mom wanted to prove that she wasn't stupid. My mom was very bright, very smart. My mom went to Sacramento College and we lived in Grass Valley. So it was 100, over 110 miles from our house to where my mom was going to college. And then when I was 14 and a half, my sisters, Bobby and Shelby, were put in a Adventist home. Bob and Margaret Evans that lived, that went to our church, they lived in Nevada City. But I was left alone. So that tells you what was more important to my mom, her schooling or her children. She graduated cum laude Lottie of her class, her nursing class in Sacramento College. And I only had, I didn't have any friends. There was only two girls that were my age at the Grass Valley. I think it's called Lone Pine Academy in gra between Grass Valley and Nevada City. So I didn't have any friends. There was Robin and Mary. They were the only two girls. And then Mr. Hickerson's son, Craig, was my age and they felt sorry for me because they saw how Robin and Mary would treat me and I didn't have any food. Uh, half the time I, I didn't, I'd go to school without any breakfast because uh, Bob was gone, he was gone gambling. And I remember going four days without a bite of food and I thought, this is ridiculous. Bob is gambling, he's been gone for days. So I went out in the middle of the highway at 2.30 in the morning and I stuck out my thumb. I was 14 and a half. And a couple picked me up and they took me to where downtown Grass Valley and I walked into the card room where Bob was playing. And I walked in and they go, hey, 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 you're, you can't go in there. And I says, I want Bob. And I went back where Bob was and I said, you haven't been home there's no electricity, there's no food. We didn't have phone, TV, radio, nothing. No communications out on this 10 acre dump. And my mom was gone, hadn't been home for two weeks. My sisters, and here I was alone. And I says, and he goes, hey, 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 let me finish this game here. And so they fed me there at the tavern. And then I waited and Bob finally came out and then I had to drive him home. I don't think he was drinking, but he had me drive home at 14 and a half. And I was so lonely and the girls would make fun of me because I didn't have anything nice to wear. They all shopped at, I think the carousel or something. And I have incredibly large feet. I wear size 11 and a half women's shoes. And in the third grade, I had a size 10 foot. And so I had to wear men's shoes. And I was incredibly sad about wearing men's shoes and tennis shoes. You know, it was just ugly. And the first day of school, we went to the church Dorcas and I picked out two skirts that looked new. And one was red, white, and blue. It was all a theme of boating. I went to school the first day of school dressed in these skirts. One was red, white, and blue, and the other was fall theme, and they were both of the boating, like Nantucket Bay or something. And I thought I looked nice. Portia said, oh, look what Cheryl's wearing. Oh my gosh, my aunt gave those to the church Dorcas, and she's wearing it. Oh, <laughs> And I felt so ashamed and so embarrassed. I had a panic attack and I wanted to die. I ran off the playground and then they would drive by my house and they'd go, hey, Amazon woman. Cause I had very hairy arms and very hairy legs. And my mom wouldn't let me shave. And I obeyed my mom even though she wasn't home. 
half the time, she wouldn't have noticed that I shaved my arms and my legs. And, but I obeyed her and I believed in my mom because sometimes I would see God working. Like one time the pastor was talking about returning tithes and offerings and my mom had come home that weekend. She came home every other weekend. She'd bring my sisters and I was so excited because I'd have my sisters and I had a horse. What I didn't know is Bob was boarding the horses and he told me they were mine. And anyway, so for two years I thought I had these horses and then all of a sudden the horses were leaving. So I was just incredibly lonely and hungry and I walked down to the neighbor's house. We were on 10 acres and if you saw the property, it still looks the same now. And I went several acres away and I knocked on this woman's door. Her name was Cassandra. And I told her, I'm hungry. Can I feed, clean your house and, in exchange for some food? She says, absolutely, honey, come in. And so she helped me. She had a two-year-old little girl. So I would clean her house and she would feed me. And then she took me to the swimming pool. She gave me money to go into the swimming pool. And then she would give me money for a candy bar. So I would have something for lunch and then she gave me a candy bar and I would swim for hours. Well, I met this girl, Christy, and it was right before 4th of July. And uh, Christy said she had a friend, Neil Chester Jones III, and that I could ride motorcycles. So we would go to Malakoff Diggings going lickety split and I was wearing just short shorts and no helmet or anything going down the highway there up in Grass Valley, Penn Valley and all of Placerville, it was crazy. And we went to Malakoff Diggings and it was 4th of July and Neil tried to kiss me and I didn't want to be kissed. And I had signed a, a temperance card that you were given, you made a promise and then Ellen White had some quotes and I had signed that to not have caffeine or drugs or do things or even eat meat. <laughs> and uh, so I, I was really, really careful about that and I took my religion seriously and my baptism. And my mom had come home for the weekend and there was no soap, no money for soap and she had a couple of dollars or coins left and the pastor was, uh, Venon was talking about returning tithes and offerings. So my mom put, her heart was moved by the Lord and I remember my mom was always crying while we were in church. Bob was never there. Once in a while he'd be there but if it only meant for him to meet somebody that he could scam, he scammed a lot of people. My mom put all her money in the offering plate and she didn't have any money for soap. We needed laundry soap and dish soap. And there was no way to wash dishes or to do laundry. And we really needed that. So here we are driving home after church and my mom's crying and praying. And she says, oh, I gave all that I had. And I said, what's that hanging on the door handle, mom? And she parked and I ran to the door. There's soap, two samples of soap, dish soap and laundry soap. So I like to think that the minute my mom was returning the tithes and offerings, that that person was hanging the soap samples on our door. That was weird because nobody at our church knew that we were out of soap. So, and we lived 10 miles out of town and living on 10 acres. And who in their right mind would come up to our door to try to sell us something? Because we obviously were very poor. And the house that we lived in was called the Dew Drop Inn. It was a tavern. And the prostitutes used to go upstairs. And my sisters said it was haunted. So <laughs> it was crazy. So I met Christy and this guy. And then her boyfriend, she was having sex with her boyfriend. And I said, Christy, that's horrible. And so I had used Cassandra's phone. And I called Christy and I says, we were talking about what she was doing. And I says, you know, I think you should wait until marriage. Here I was kind of naive, but yet my heart was always for the Lord. I, for some reason, the Lord was always calling me, always. And, and, but then I'd wonder, well, he's mad at me because this happened or that happened. And, um, 
Then the kids would drive by my house and call me Amazon woman as they were going to Inglebright Dam for the day. Why didn't those parents, they knew that I was by myself. All they had to do was put their brakes on and I would have jumped in the back with the rest of them and enjoyed the day at Inglebright Dam where they all went on their houseboats and jet skis, not jet skis, but ski boats and stuff, but they didn't. And I just couldn't believe the, the incredible abuse that I got from the teachers and the students. Um, the teacher told me I was either Einstein or an idiot because I came to the conclusion of a math program problem and he wanted to see how I did it and I showed him and it wasn't anything like what I was taught and he says well either you're Einstein or you're an idiot and we know you're not Einstein and he's put me in front of everybody and he says oh look what she did and he made me write on the board how I came to that conclusion actually that's pretty bright even though I got all D's and F's and I failed every grade when I went to college, I took algebra and I got A's, and I got all A's in geology. I was getting my degree in geology in 95. Plus, I went to a police academy, and I got another college courses, so I wasn't stupid, but I had a learning disability. I didn't, I didn't have parents to guide me. I was on my own. Plus, I had a learning disability. I didn't retain what I read because I was always thinking about being abused. Or was my mom going to come home that weekend? Or was Bob going to be gone for five days? So I want to clarify, Bob is my biological father. He never earned the title of being father, so I call him Bob. And I've called him Bob for a long time because I'm the only one in the family that he beat. And I mean, he beat me so bad when I was 15. He, he beat me so bad that he took a belt and he beat me from one end to the other and he left a huge goose egg sized hematoma on the back of my leg and I was working for a uh, care facility as I was a sous chef. I worked every weekend and I gave my mom the paycheck so she can pay rent and buy food. And I worked uh, 16 hours a week on the weekend and sometimes I'd work at night uh, after school and I was supposed to pay, help pay my academy bill down in order to graduate. And that was the days they, they could do that. But I was failing. I got all D's and F's, so they said I wasn't going to graduate. And then when Bob beat me so bad, I was trying to get ready for work. And here's Felix, my cat. He knows when I'm, my hug. This cat is incredible. He, this is Felix, the wonderful cat. And he loves piano music. When I start playing Moonlight Sonata, he comes running. My dad blamed me before I was born. He blamed me for all his failures. And because my mom got pregnant with me, he couldn't, he wanted to be a doctor, which is ridiculous because that was hard for me to look at him as a father. But when he beat me that Sabbath afternoon, I was getting some shoe polish from the cupboard and there, there was a bathroom and then their bedroom, their bedroom and then my sister's bedroom and everybody was sleeping and I had to get to work and I needed some white shoe polish for my shoes. And I had to be at work like one o'clock to help uh, dish up or help with dishes and then get the evening meal ready and I, he would leave me alone. He, so I was alone from three o'clock to eight o'clock serving 75 meals and five or six different diets. So at 15 and a half, I was incredibly uh, responsible. The house was always messy unless I cleaned it. And I opened the cabinet, was looking for shoe polish, and the bottle of shoe polish fell and hit the floor and made some noise. And then Bob opened the door and he started cussing. He says, what's going on? I knew better than not to talk back to him or look you know have a disrespectful and I was scared of him I says oh I, I got to get some shoe polish he says you're making noise I says I'm sorry so he grabbed my hair and he pulled me down to the floor and he kicked and kicked and kicked me well because he didn't have his boots on thank God he uh, went and got his belt 
he took his belt off his, and he looped it, and he held the loop end, and he took the buckle, and he started beating me, and beating me, beating, beating me, and I was just covered with the bruises, and then the hematoma on the back of my leg, it was about the size of an egg, and it was hard, and I hobbled. I, I got, I polished my shoes, and I hobbled the mile and a half, two miles to my job. I tried to stop crying and hobbled all the way to work. And when I got there, the, the head chef took a look at me and he says, what happened? I says, my father beat me. And so he says, just a minute. So he came back and then the nursing director wanted me to go into her office. I thought, oh dear, I'm in trouble. I didn't want to miss work. I was always punctual. I was a really good worker. And she says, what happened? And she wanted to see my bruises. And she says, stay here. And when she saw the bruises on my back, the buckle marks, probably about 10 buckle marks on my back, not the belt loop, but the buckle. He was careful not to leave bruises on my face. I waited and I sat in the nurse's office and pretty soon here comes the police. And they picked me up and they took me to juvenile hall. This was Sabbath afternoon. Nobody talked to me and they put me in this little room. I remember, all I can remember is the room was plain. I was alone. I was there from Sabbath, Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night, three nights. And Tuesday morning, my mom came to talk to me. We were alone and he says, Cheryl, you better change your story. You cannot tell them what your dad did. I said, Mom, he tried to kill me. She says, if you tell, then Bob's going to go to jail, then your sisters will be put in foster care where they'll all be molested, so it will be your fault that your sisters got raped and molested. So you got to tell them that you did it to yourself because Bob cannot go to jail, or your dad can't go to jail. My mom told me I was supposed to tell him that I did that to myself. But how can, how can a girl make, hit, it's impossible, you can't hit yourself with a buckle like that. I don't remember what I told them. That is just a blur. I remember when I got home, Bob was so mad at me. And he kept saying, why don't you commit suicide? You need to kill yourself. So Bob and his brother Chet were, they would steal cars, change the VIN numbers and everything. And they got a Corsa Corvair. Bob handed me the keys and he says, why don't you go kill yourself? And he let me drive it and he says, it'd be good, the car, there's something wrong with the engine, it would be a good way to collect the insurance. And then he kept telling me, you need to kill yourself, you need to die. And so I was so upset one morning. It was a foggy morning and it had been misting and I went the back roads from Redlands, California to Yucaipa, the back road. And I was going 80 miles an hour. And there was a car coming my way and I thought, oh, here, I'll have a head-on collision with this car. And then I thought, no, I don't want to hurt somebody else. So I jerked the wheel and the car went end over end and I counted one, two, three. And I had grabbed the side of the seat and I held on, I had my seat belt on. <laughs> if I was gonna kill myself, I don't know, I didn't do a very good job. And I hung on to the side of the seat as it went end over end, not sideways, end over end. And it went down an embankment, I think, because I was going 80 miles an hour and then skidding, and then went end over end. Anyway, I took that car all the way down to the frame, the door frame. But I was inside the car, and I wasn't severely injured. For some reason, I, was, I lived through it. A California Highway Patrol were there. There were a couple of units. And 
they wanted to keep me warm and so they brought out these body bags. Well, I knew what body bags looked like because my mom worked at the ER and I wasn't having any part of those body bags. And I said, no, I'm not dead, I'm not dead, don't put me in the body bag. And they said, well, we got to put you in there because you're cold. And I said, no, I'm not dead. And I remember it was an orange body bag and there was no way. I so. But I needed to lay down because I had a lot of back injuries and soft tissue injuries and they took me to the hospital. It was a couple of hours later that my mom and dad, Bob and my mom showed up. Bob told me you didn't do it right. He wanted me dead. But I'm the only one that he did that to. And my mom would tell me, you know, God is punishing you. God is doing this. And I was 16 years old then when I had the accident. And then the flood of Loma Linda, 1969. And there was a wash behind our house. There was a bridge right there. And pretty soon the water was hitting the bridge. Our house was completely destroyed. It was blown completely off. There was only part of the roof. The telephone still worked. My parents' bedroom and my sister's bedroom was clothes were hanging. My room was completely gone. I had white French provincial furniture that my uncle had fixed for me, so it was distinctive. It was white with gold. That was found three miles down the wash. And my mom said, God was punishing the family. And the reason your room was destroyed was because you were such a bad girl. I had a poster on the wall and it said the word groovy and my mom said the word groovy was a satanic word. My parents moved into a two-bedroom apartment there in Loma Linda and my sisters were given a bedroom and my parents had a bedroom and there was a cot underneath the window in the living room and my mom said you can stay here a few nights but we don't want you here. You are a bad girl and she locked me out of the house. I went next door and this woman that was a secretary, unit secretary at Loma Linda, her name was Ginger, she said, you can stay with us a few nights. I had a friend, Linda Schaefer, and her older brothers, Dick and Robert Schaefer. Dick, Robert Schaefer was the hospital, Loma Linda hospital spokesperson. Anyway, his parents were just appalled by the way my parents treated me. And so they let me stay there with them. And I really did take my faith seriously, even though it was up and down, backwards and forwards. And I really didn't have, I knew there was a God and I used to pray all the time. And I would tell the Lord, I'm lonely, please send me a friend. I don't have anybody, I don't have TV, I don't have radio. I wanted to play music. I wanted to do all these things. And my sisters were living elsewhere and Bob was always gone playing cards and my mom was gone. I didn't have anywhere to go and I remember walking the streets of Loma Linda and then I went into the hospital and I would go into the nurses lounge and I would sleep in the night because I knew it was warm and I would tell them my mom was upstairs working because that's something I did a few times. So but then I was afraid I was going to get caught my mom hadn't been home for two weeks because it was getting towards the end of her schooling and she was uh, getting her, she was getting ready to take her state boards and her nursing boards. But my sisters were like my babies and my mom would work uh, Saturday night plus she was, uh, would study while she was in college getting her nursing degree. She drove a 63 Plymouth Fury that her parents had purchased, it was turquoise and my sisters were in the back and I was so excited and I remember running up to my mom and Bob was mowing the lawn. So I was 14 and a half and it was August and comes this red and white truck, pickup truck. And I looked and it was Richard. It was Christy's father who I'd met once or twice. He was 45 years old. And he introduced himself to Bob and to Ruth, my mom and said that uh, I was Christy's best friend. And I thought, that's a lie, I'm not Christy's best friend. Why is he lying to her? And that kind of upset me. Richard said, 
My wife is sick and Christy is sick, they have a flu. My neighbor has a child that's uh, terminally ill and they have a couple of kids that need daycare. Can Cheryl come and babysit? And he says, I'll bring her back. Uh, they're gonna be gone for two nights and I'll bring her back in a few days. And I was shocked, I said, oh. She says, oh, you do, you go, it's your Christian duty. And I said, Mom, I don't wanna go, I wanted to stay home and I didn't wanna go with Richard because I saw him lie and I had this gut feeling. And I have developed this, what's called, and I, I don't like psychic stuff, this is, to me, that's wrong. But I developed a keen, what my counselor called, spidey sense. Because I learned to read people. I didn't want to go with that man. And my mom and dad said I needed to go. And it was 100 degrees that Friday afternoon. And I had short shorts and a short sleeve blouse. And I got in that truck with this gut feeling, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. But it's my Christian duty. And he drove into Grass Valley and he says, I'm going to get you something. So he, we went to Dairy Queen or whatever, Foster Fees. So he went in and he came back with a cherry cola. And he says, here, I, I had this made special for you. And I said, oh, it's got caffeine, I can't drink it. He says, what do you mean you can't drink it? I says, yeah, I signed a temperance card and I didn't want to drink it. And this really bothers me to this day. I uh, refused to drink that cola and he got angry and he says, I, ha I have some money. I put good money in this cherry cola that you had. God will forgive you. You can call your, ask your priest and he'll give you a sign that you can do that. But I remembered signing that temperance card but then he scared me. So I drank the soda, part of it. He says, drink it all. And I says, and he kept driving around and I had drank maybe just a cup, couple sips. And he says, you need to drink that soda. I, it's got cherries and ice and I had it special made for you. You can't throw it out. I thought, but this is against my religion. God's gonna be mad at me if I drink it. And I grappled with that because thinking about the temperance card that I signed. And then he uh, drove a little bit farther. I says, when are we going to go to those people's place? He says, well, you know, your parents don't care about you. I see the way they treat you and they treat you like an animal. Your mom doesn't love you. They don't care about you because they put your sisters in a foster home with the, the Evans. And he knew where my sisters lived. And he says, your dad, I know he doesn't love you because you are still a virgin and good fathers will take care of their daughters that way. And I'm gonna take care of you, what your dad didn't do. And I says, please, Richard, don't let me take me home, please. He says, drink your cola, drink your soda. So I would drink it begrudgingly. And I thought of tossing it out the window, but I was afraid. And he drove faster and faster. And I contemplated jumping. We went past that Vietnam War memorials thing, and there's the Yuba River down there. It's beautiful. And uh, it was a place that I loved going. And I went back there a couple of years to show my granddaughter. And I contemplated jumping out of the truck there and he just floored it. He was going really fast. And he grabbed my hand and he says, if you jump, you will get killed. And I thought, I don't care. And so he held on to me really tight and he kept driving, kept driving and the sun was getting lower in the and uh, he said, drink your soda, drink it all. Don't you dare spill it. So I would sip it and sip it. And then he went up into the mountains, up a logging road, and it was getting towards dark. He had me drink more of the soda pop. And the next thing I remember was 
me telling him not to touch me. And that's all I remember until two days later in the morning. We were pulling into my driveway and he held my hand really tight. I remember his fingers were fat and strong. And he says, if you dare tell anybody, I'll kill both your sisters. And he knew where they lived. And I thought, oh my God. So I pulled into the driveway. My mom was gone. Bob was asleep. My sisters were gone back at the Evans. So it must have been Monday morning. So I got out of the truck and he drove off and Bob was asleep. And I went, mm-hmm, and I did a funny scream and I went to the bathroom and I showered for hours. Here I was, 14 and a half, and I knew I had been raped. I had a little bit of experience because when I was five and six, I was sexually abused, but not fully raped. But this time it was different. I am lucky he did not murder me. And I went into the bathroom and I showered and I showered, tried to wash everything off of me. The water was ice cold. We didn't really have hot water there anyway. And I washed and washed. And then I went, crawled into bed. We didn't have much blankets. And I put the carpet, I was ice cold, even though it was summer. I put uh, the rugs on top of my bed. And Bob didn't even wake up. And I went to sleep. And I, I don't know how long I slept, a day, two. I don't remember. The drug was wearing off. I knew I, I mean, I didn't know I had been drugged. So Rohypnol is like having a recorder with no tape in it. That's the drug that was popular back in the early 60s. And they said, you will not remember a thing. So there's, and he says, besides, you don't want to know. But looking back, I'd been drugged by Rohypnol and that was what was putting my cola. Then, it was a week or two later, my mom came home. I had a panic attack at church, and that's when I told her what Richard had done, and she told me, I, if I dare tell, she couldn't pass her state boards, that she needed to be the that, she can't call the police. All this trouble would be all my problems, all my fault, and I was crying, and I said, Lord, please help me. Two weeks later, when my mom came home, we were at church, and I had a panic attack and I was going <gasps> and my mom took my arm she was on this side she took my arm she pinched me and she says I'm gonna pinch harder if you don't shut up we were upstairs and we walked and she said let's go to the car so we went to the car and she says what is wrong with you and I went he raped me he raped me and I was going <gasps> and I had a full-blown panic attack so she said and I couldn't breathe. So she took me to the ER where she worked there in Grass Valley. And she says, don't you dare tell them what is wrong. Just tell them that you're crazy. And they gave me Librium. And then my mom took me to stay with another family. And my mom took my sisters back to the Evans. And my mom went back to Sacramento. And there I was with this strange couple from church. And there was Richard waiting outside their house. So he knew where I was and I was terrified. And Bob picked me up and took me back to the house. And I had a pet deer that I would feed Bob cigarettes. I don't know why the deer liked the cigarettes, but I would give it some oats and cigarettes and stuff. This deer was my best friend. It's my only friend. And as I was petting the deer, someone took a high-powered rifle and shot the deer right in front of me. And my deer ran off, leading a trail of blood back into the hills. And Bob and his brother, Chet, came up from Southern California too. And they went after Richard and they took chains and they beat his teeth out. But the police were never called. My mom says, don't you dare tell anyone because if I don't pass my state boards, I won't get my nursing degree 
your sisters will be put in foster care and molested. The same old tapes is what she told me when I was six years old. Homie, don't you dare tell. Don't tell. So I held that in and I didn't tell anybody for decades. I kept it in from the time I was 14 and a half until I was 30 something. I was totally healthy. I was a cop. I was a deputy sheriff. I could climb a 10 foot wall. I was an excellent marksman with 357. And then I had a complete breakdown. First of all, I want to tell parents, don't trust anybody. Because we don't know what can happen. I think children need to be aware. Not everybody is good, no matter what position they hold, how nice they are. And the nicer they are, the worse they are. Don't trust anybody. And if you have a feeling, go with it. Go with that. And if you feel like you can't tell your parents, tell, tell somebody, call the police. They'll, they'll keep it private. You've got to share, tell somebody what is on your heart, what your fears are, and go with your gut feeling. You've got to trust your instinct and what I like to say is spidey sense. And if somebody is being extra nice to you and, and giving you presents, uh-uh, nope, nope, nope. So just be really careful and tell, tell somebody even though they threaten and they tell you that bad things are gonna happen if you dare tell, no, tell, you need to tell. Don't keep it in. I kept it in. I wasn't into rock music. I wasn't into drugs, I wasn't into drinking, although I had done a little bit of it, just out of curiosity. And uh, a friend, Bob Thompson, he says, you can, I can take you over this place, it's the dance hall. Alice Cooper was there and it scared me. They were shooting drugs, they were doing heroin, and that really scared me. Need of course, needles was uh, terrifying to me. I got drugged, and that's when I got pregnant. I had nowhere to go. And then I got kicked out of Loma Linda Academy because I was such a bad girl. And my parents told me they were moving to San Diego, but they wouldn't even give me the address. This is something I made up. My family has never heard me play. I started, began, I began playing and learning to read music three years ago. I have to find a way to let go of the bitterness and anger and know that my mom was screwed up. She was messed up. She didn't have her theology right. I um, took a video of myself playing gone her ashes are in a wall there in uh, Mount Scott I knew she wasn't able to listen but I was able to tell her that she was wrong I could play I was gifted Mom's been gone for a decade. But there's one thing that I had to do. I had to forgive my mom. And to let go of the bitterness. Because holding on to the bitterness and being angry that I was never given piano lessons that I begged for didn't help me. my mom for her allowing me to be hurt 
and for her to teach me that God was a mean monster. I've had to let go because it's made me sick. My autoimmune, my body's turned on itself. So I took a recording of me playing the prelude and fugue in C major. I can play it perfectly when I'm alone. I learned that in two months. So I took the recording and I played it, even though, and I said, Mom, I know you can't hear me, but I want you to know that you hurt me. And I didn't serve to be treated like I had been hated. And they taught my family to hate me. And I told her, say, Mom, I can play. You were wrong, even though I'm 60. I started playing, when, taking lessons when I was 65. And it's hard for an older person's brain to soak in, you know, to read music and to play the right timing. Anyway, no matter what you're going through, or how messed up your family is. Jesus is always there. And he showed me many times that he's there because he saved me again and again. And the fact that the Richard took me home and let me go, but then he shot the deer right in front of me. He missed me. But I've learned to talk to the Lord on my own because nobody listens. And nowadays, counselors have their own ideas. They don't like religion. But counseling is good. You, you have to be careful. Find one that loves the Lord, that won't persuade you otherwise. And know that God does forgive you. Like God forgave me for disobeying my temperance card. Richard might have killed me had I thrown that drink away. Who knows what he would do it but he intended on bad, doing bad that weekend. You don't have to hang on to Jesus because Jesus is hanging on to you. And I'm living proof. And I want to encourage you, no matter how bad things get, Jesus is always there. And he has answers. Only he has the answers. And he is coming soon, and I believe that he saved me for a purpose. I must tell Jesus, Jesus will help me, Jesus alone. <laughs>